Well, I, I think for a start that people have to decide the, uh, the value of uh, two different things. One, if, if you've offended somebody in this context, uh, whether or not you feel you were uh, right or wrong, it's what the other side feels is what's important. This is The Brandon Smith Show, and I'm your host, Brandon Smith, and the entire purpose of this show is one singular thing, and that is to help you live a life that much more free from dysfunction. So our topic and theme for our show today is kind of, uh, we whether we call it negotiations or we call it conflict resolution, it's essentially how when we enter into a situation where there is tension, conflict, we're butting heads, we're not seeing a path forward, how do we navigate that? How do we create a solution that works for everybody and a path that's going to be the most uh, productive? And so to help us on this journey, I've got uh, Doug Yarn, professor at uh, Georgia State University College of Law, uh, an expert in this arena uh, to help guide us on this. Doug, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Brandon, for inviting me. Happy yeah. to be here. Thrilled to have you here. So before we jump into all the different paths we can go down in this uh, very important sandbox, tell us a little bit about you. How did you, how did you get doing what you're doing? What's, what's been your journey? And then what are some of the, your areas that you're most passionate about in this space? Well, um, that's uh, like a lot of people, my journey has had a lot of different paths and somehow maybe coming together here in my mid 60s, we'll see. Uh, but I, I started my academic life out anyway as a primatologist um, and uh, eventually. OK, so uh, primatologist, I think you need to tell us what that means. I, I studied uh, primarily chimpanzees, pan troglodytes. Uh, okay. at Yerkes Primate uh, Research Center uh, in Atlanta, and then later at Duke University. Um, and, but eventually I moved into anth uh, cultural anthropology from that physical anthropology end of things. And then uh, I went off into a, kind of a whole different, different world entirely. You know, this was the 70s. I, I went to India and did uh, cultural anthropology field work I've learned how to play some musical instruments over there. I began to import them into the United States and I started a music business. So I know a lot of your listeners are in business. So I wanted to assure them I have been in business. <laughs> <laughs> I had the, the second largest musical retail uh, chain uh, in the country uh, by 1979. Wow. Uh, and the industry collapsed in, the, uh, in 1980. And my experience uh, during that uh, period, dealing with lawyers and trying to figure out how to unwind the business, uh, led me to think, well, any idiot could be a lawyer. So, well, here I, why not? <laughs> so I went to law school and uh, became a litigator. Hmm. Uh, and as I was... Uh, litigating, I realized, well, from my business experience, I know that I can transact most of these disputes in some way or another, hmm. that uh, we don't have to take all these things to court. In fact, litigators spend most of their time negotiating uh, disputes huh. and trying to resolve them rather than taking disputes to court. So I began working in an area called alternative dispute resolution. Uh, at, at the time, it was sort of a new wave sort of thing and begin uh, promoting that and uh, developing my skills in that as a mediator, that is a third party who comes in and intervenes in a dispute and helps the parties negotiate a solution uh, to their uh, uh, dispute. So uh, after mediating for a number of years and, and starting to teach mediation, uh, Georgia State Law School asked me to come on and uh, be a faculty member to teach their students how to be better lawyers by being better negotiators when they graduate. So I've spent uh, the last oh, almost 30 years uh, teaching uh, law students how to be better lawyers, better negotiators, and I think better people ultimately from that. Wow. Wow. So what makes, what makes me excited? Well, uh, I, 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 
it, that's very hard to say these days because in the current political climate, I don't want to get off into that. That's probably not of great interest to your listeners, but it, but it does seem very tense, the tribalism, the inability to resolve disputes. So that is discouraging because those people could do a lot better, uh, perhaps, uh, if they were interested in resolving their disputes, which frankly is not the case. But uh, I do get excited watching that and thinking of ways to kind of work through that and helping people work through those kinds of situations. I'm particularly interested in how people reconcile. Hmm. That is how they uh, resolve uh, a conflict and begin trusting each other and working with each other again. I think this is particularly important in the workplace where you have to encounter each other over and over again. A lot of disputes that lawyers look at People are encountering each other maybe one time. You know, they have yeah. a, an, a car wreck or something. Or, or it may be an employment dispute, but the employee has been fired. Uh, so they're, they don't have an ongoing relationship. But it's really important, I think, for people that have an ongoing relationship, like in a business environment, to, to not only resolve their dispute, but resolve it in a way that makes them trust each other and to be able to work and cooperate with each other more constructively in the future. That's, I love that idea, particularly when you're sitting right next to each other and you know, your office is right next to each other. It's like, I'm going to see this person every day. How do I get down that path of Yeah, um, and of I, reconciliation? Uh, one of the things I've been doing for the last 20 years is I've been working for the university system of Georgia, resolving disputes in university settings and departments and uh, colleges and, and such. And uh, you know what they say about uh, disputes in education, why they're so vicious? It's because the stakes are so small. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, uh, um, these are people who need to cooperate with each other because we, invo- we do a lot of self-governance in higher education. So in order to work toward your mission of teaching the students and doing research and all that kind of stuff, you really need to learn to work together and a lot of times people in higher education, they, they don't think they need to. They're sort of off on their own, faculty members and such. Uh, but uh, I've been doing a lot of intervention uh, in institutions of higher education uh, in Georgia and around the country and, yeah. and consulting uh, for the institutions in other parts of the world as well. All right. Well, I think hearing you talk, I've got a perfect path for us today. I want to start down the path of what are things that you see your best practices around um, uh, resolution, whether it's alternative dispute resolution or, or general conflict? What are some of those things that our listeners can take away that would be helpful for them? And then let's go into this path of, of reconciliation, because I think that is so absolutely true. I have clients right now um, that I'm brought into. So you know, my, my, one of my degrees is a clinical therapy degree from Georgia State. And so I did, I did uh, clinical work for a number of years before I transitioned into the workplace. And I often get brought in to kind of essentially do a couples counseling for two leaders to get them to work better together. So I'd be really curious on that too, because you're right. You make a great point. These are folks you're going to see every day at the water cooler, getting coffee. Hopefully they don't uh, pour their coffee over your head. Um, So (laughs) how do we do that? So let's, let's start down that first path. When you think about, uh, best practices or mindsets or ways to approach a conflict or some situation where we've just butted heads, what are some tips or tactics you might be able to offer us? Well, the, there, there are kind of two ways we could go with this, Brandon. One is what's best practice for an organization? That is an organizational culture or the kind of institutional structures that an organizational may have or policies that it may have to encourage people to reconcile, to resolve their conflicts at the lowest possible level so that it has the least um, negative consequence to the organization as a whole. Um, And the other path we could go is what individuals can do. What are best practices for individuals? And of course, organizations are made up of individuals. So it's, these are kind of, uh, these 
two different areas often kind of overlap. They, yeah. they might conflate in different ways. I like thinking th about the systemic approach first, you know, rather than put the Band-Aid on it, let's actually try mm -hmm. and fix the whole system. So let's start down mm -hmm. the first path first. What might be some good policies, um, uh, cultural norms, whatever you, we want to call them that an organization or, or leadership can put in place? Well, I think leadership has to um, take the attitude that I, I know part of your show is about dysfunction. I like dysfunction because <laughs> dysfunction is telling me that something's wrong. Now, something's That's another sound wrong, bite, by the way, Isaac. We're going to grab that from Doug. Love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> of course, it gives me a job if there's dysfunction. <laughs> That's true. But, but an organization and leadership in an organization to take the mindset that dysfunction is an opportunity. Because what it's doing is, is a symptom of an underlying conflict. So it's a symptom of something uh, that where something is going wrong within the organization, where where. Uh, the goals of the organization or individuals within the organization, their goals are being thwarted in some way or another yeah. uh, by yeah. a condition or situation. And uh, because things constantly change, it's natural for an organization to have conflict over and over again. So we should be positive about conflict. We should look at it as an opportunity for it to evolve, to make a better organization because an organization is facing constant changes in this environment, both its internal environment and its external environment. So the conflict is natural. It's going to lead to, to moments of dysfunction. Leadership should say, whoa, that's a great opportunity. Let's jump into that. Let's solve that in such a way that our organization is healthier and better, better meets the environment, uh, both our internal environment and the external environment in which we operate meets it head on and much healthier makes it in maybe uh, evolutionary terms more fit. So I love, so I love what you're saying, but it also begs this idea of how do we put the right rules in place so that conflict stays within the uh, healthy box and doesn't, doesn't cause more problems. So how, how do, how do we do that? How do we manage the conflict? So there, I think there are a couple of different ways to approach that. One is you can't tamp it down. You need to have outlets for it. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, best ways to approach that as an organization is to look at it holistically. How does your organization deal with conflict mo more broadly? And uh, think of this as a, as a triangle, okay? And that a sick organization has an inverted triangle, and I'll come to that in a moment. So in this triangle, let's say the bottom part of the triangle is interest. That is, approach, approach the resolution of conflict by dealing with people's interests. The, the middle part of the triangle is rights, approaching uh, uh, people's uh, disputes and conflicts with a rights-based approach. That is kind of legally, you know, what does the contract say, that kind of thing. And the top part of the triangle is power, the use of power. That is, in just imposing solutions making people do this or that in order to resolve the conflict. Most conflicts within an organization are conflicts of interest between in individuals within the organization. So you should approach it with an interest approach, uh, typically negotiating, uh, people working together to align their interests better, uh, to find a solution that uh, meets both their mutual interests in some way or another. A sick organization kind of turns that on its head. It uses the rights approach more than an interest-based approach and more than, uh, excuse me, it uses the power approach more than a rights approach or an interest-based approach. Yeah. So you want to keep that triangle up like this and that the base of it is a really strong interest-based approach to resolving uh, disputes and conflict within an organization. Use rights only sparingly and power very little, only when needed. Um, so an organization, uh, so here in Georgia, we don't have that, that much uh, organized labor, but let's say a strike, a labor strike is a, is a power approach to try to resolve a problem. Mm -hmm. um, that should be used sparingly. 
everything else should be used before you get to that uh, in some, some way or another. So in, in any, any way along those lines, if, if the first time you hear of a conflict is that your employee has sued you, which is a rights-based approach, you've got a problem. Okay, so what I want to do is we're going to go to break. When we come back from break, I, I want to dig into that a little bit more because I think you're making a really profound statement around indicators that we haven't, there's not a good process in place. But I also want to talk to you more about uh, how do we stay in that interest place? How, what are some good ways to keep the conversation there and not having it move up? Because I can also see how seductive it is to move up that triangle. Well, I'm just going to use power. I'm just going to use rights and I'm going to show them. Um, and but as what I'm hearing you say, that's not going to yield the result that we want. So let's we'll go to break. When we come back, uh, we're going to pick up with that. I am I cannot wait to hear what you have to say. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Here's your coaching minute for the week, presented to you by the Leadership Foundry. So building credibility is essential to us as leaders, both in terms of working with our team, but also in terms of building credibility with others. One of the easy ways to do that is to focus on being more responsive. How responsive are you to emails, whether it's from your team or other leaders? That is a, as a good friend of mine and guest on regular guest on my podcast, John Kim says, responsiveness is cheap currency. And what John means by that is it's really easy to do but it goes a long way. I had a leader I worked with several years ago and he would typically respond to emails four to six weeks after they were sent and he had no credibility with his team. So here's a challenge for you. Work on your responsiveness. Can you respond to emails within 24 to 48 hours? Now, what that doesn't mean is you have to respond with an answer. It can just simply mean, hey, I got it. I'll get back to you by whatever date. But by focusing on responsiveness, that can enhance your credibility. So give it a try. All right, welcome back from break. Of course, this is the Brandon Smith Show. And before break, uh, Professor Doug Yarn was taking us through this path of negotiations, how we can do a better job inside our organization of putting in place the right policies, process, so people are staying at the interest level. And I love, Doug, I love that image you had of that triangle. The, the, the interest at the bottom, rights next, and power at the top. And we want to make sure we're hanging out about interest because we can have more success there versus leveraging legalese and our rights or uh, using our power position to get what we want. I, th- I think the point there is the more you focus on resolving things through the interest-based approach, the less costly it is both to the organization and to the individual. And I would imagine what we're going to talk about pretty soon is reconciliation. And I would imagine the uh, the scars are not near as deep if you're at the interest level versus when you move up that path. It's probably That's a lot right. harder to rebuild trust when you've used the rights it's weapon or the power much weapon. Much harder because you have you've developed an adversarial approach at that point, yeah. uh, and 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 that's hard on a relationship. So uh, I so. You and I, I, I know you and I want to go down there, but I would love to hear a little bit more about the interest-based approach. How do we stay there? How do we? How can we make sure that's where we hang out? Well, I, I think organizationally, leadership in an organization needs to focus on what its conflict management system is. Every organization, every human or uh, social uh, network and structure has some uh, either explicit or implicit method of how it resolves disputes. Mm. And most organizations are not very good about looking at how res- disputes get resolved within their own organization mm. and being really intentional about the design uh, of their conflict management system, which is going to exist one way or the other. So you need one that, that focuses everything toward uh, interest first, trying to resolve disputes uh, through interests. So I think the, one of the best ways to start is training everybody. So, for example, at one point, uh, my team went to uh, a university here in the state that I won't name. We trained every faculty member and every administrator uh, in that university uh, in uh, interest-based negotiation approaches and, in, and uh, also how to manage anger, how to manage difficult people, all those kinds of things, things that you probably have covered on the show in different times. 
But the, um, the best way to do it is start with a culture through educating people to be trained, uh, to learn how to resolve these disputes uh, through an interest-based approach, to be proactive at it. Um, and that's the best way to, to get people to, to resolve these things at the lowest possible, least costly level. Beyond that, I think you need uh, other structures within the organization that are open so that people can go and air their disputes and, uh, and to get advice on how to resolve them. So many large organizations have an ombuds office, an ombuds person. Yep. Uh, they're called organizational ombuds people who are like big complaint handlers where you can go confidentially, get some conflict coaching, uh, get some help about how the organization uh, might support uh, a resolution of the dispute at a lower level, particularly if you can't go to your immediate manager. You, you may have a dispute with your manager. And uh, so organizations need to have ways to go around rank and file in order to address conflict that may occur uh, between uh, managers and subordinates. Okay. Uh, there are lots of different approaches to this. Uh, Home Depot has worked hard on this. Uh, UPS, uh, we've consulted with, they've, they've done a good job on this. There are many organizations, uh, business organizations in the Atlanta area, but, but nationally and internationally uh, that, that have um, really intentional conflict management systems. Uh, a really big one is Halliburton. It has, a, has an extensive, well-developed conflict management system uh, throughout its organization. Uh, so there, there are lots of examples out there, but I don't, getting to the, the weeds here at this point might be kind of getting us off the track a bit. So I listen. I was making lots of notes as you were talking, and I think I've got it into a process. So I want to lay. I want to present it to you and see if I'm hearing this right. And I, it almost feels like the first question is the most important, and that is actually ask ourselves as an organization: How are we approaching conflict? What's our approach for that? And I think asking the question seems to be the first step and then yes. creating some kind of a, a belief system or view or point of view on what that needs to look like. That sounds like that's part two. So how do we yes. want to do it? And then part three then is, okay, let's train everybody on that. Let's give everybody training. So everybody's on board, understands what we're trying to do and understands what they need to do in those situations. And then part four is what's our ongoing support system, our mechanisms that we're going to have going to be. Right. Is it ongoing training? Is it a is an um, um, buds person or, or role or some kind of outlet so people have a, a, a way and a place to go when they need additional help or coaching or guidance? Did right. I seem to get that right? Yeah, I, that, exactly right. Now, if I were being a, a consultant going into an organization, we would do a conflict assessment. We, we, we would assess how the organization is managing this conflict and the, and the costs of that. And then we would uh, pull together the stakeholders throughout the organization, um, train them in more constructive conflict management techniques and about conflict management system design, and then get them to create the design together. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, kind of a cooperative design creation so that all the stakeholders will buy in. Uh, and then uh, to pull from uh, the business school stuff, we do continuous uh, quality uh, management. Uh, it, we continually assess uh, over time, have a committee in the organization that's always assessing over time how that system is working. Beautiful. The elements of the system might be we have internal mediators, we have man managers that have open door policies uh, that throughout the organization uh, who do conflict coaching. We could have an ombuds person. Uh, we could train everybody when they come in. Uh, as to this is the organization's approach to conflict. Um, this is what this, the skill set you need to have. Um, with respect to that skill set, and I, I don't think we have time to go into this, but um, the, I think the most important set of skills would be one that follows the Fisher and Murray getting to yes approach. Mm. Uh, uh, being able to engage in interest-based negotiation with your peers, uh, with your supervisor, with those who you manage uh, below, anyone else in the organization. And there, and there are really five basic steps to that. And that is when you have a, 
when you realize you have a dispute and a problem, that you separate the people from the problem, that you focus on that problem, not, not on the people, but that you, but the discussion focuses on the problem itself and what that yeah. problem is. The second is that you, that you look at people's interests, not their positions, not what they're saying they, they, they want, but why they want that, uh, and, and begin to explore that and try to understand that. Um, that you look for options for mutual gain, uh, that you explore a lot of options. I think this is where people tend to fall down in the problem solving realm is they, they, they know that one thing they've always had a hammer. So every problem's a nail, uh, they need to, they need to look deeper in their toolbox so that, um, they can brainstorm for other kinds of solutions where people, uh, everybody involved, uh, gets their interests satisfied. Hmm. Um, and uh, a, a concept that uh, a lot of people don't understand in negotiation, but is extremely helpful is called BATNA. It's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. That is, if you can't get uh, a negotiated an agreement, what's the best thing that you can do? What's, hmm. what's the best thing that, that best way forward, for example? So I, I teach lawyers, uh, who are involved in litigation for their clients. So if they can't negotiate a solution for their clients, what's the best thing that could happen to them in court at trial, for example? Um, mm. But not just the trial, but how, that, how is that going to impact uh, their client's interests in different ways? If your client needs money tomorrow and the trial is three years away, that's not a good solution. Uh, so... Uh. Uh, exam, it, understanding your bat uh, instead of a imaginary bottom line that I'm not going to take anything less than a hundred dollars for this rug I'm selling you here at our Turkish rug bazaar. Um, that that might be just an imaginary bottom line, but uh, it, it, but instead of that a bat, if I don't sell this hundred dollar rug today, and I need the money, I'd better figure out you know what's the best thing that I can do you know and so instead of maybe holding that hundred dollars it may be very satisfactory for me to sell it for night I, I don't know if that was clear or not but that's a that's a that's a concept that's kind of part of this too yeah absolutely that's beautiful uh so i i know we're getting close on time and i want to make sure we at least touch on reconciliation because i think that's important too so what are maybe a couple a couple nuggets you can offer us, things that you're noticing or things we could start to be thinking about or doing when we have to now rebuild the relationship after we've come to some agreement, but there's been some damage along the way. Maybe there was a, st a step into the rights uh, level or the power level, and now we've got to work with this person. Uh, what are some things that you're noticing that are good best practices or things we should be thinking about? Well, I, I think for a start that, People have to decide the, uh, the value of uh, two different things. One, if, if you've offended somebody in this context, uh, whether or not you feel you were uh, right or wrong, it's what the other side feels is what's important. And if, you, if, you, if you've hurt somebody or someone's angry at you for the way you've acted, uh, consider an apology, a sincere apology. Uh, this is a lot, this is hard for a lot of people to do, but it, it's a, if you apologize sincerely, it is a big step toward rebuilding trust and cooperation. And if you're on the other side of this, uh, be forgiving. Um, now people are generally more forgiving when they're really dependent on the other person. Uh, but genuine forgiveness requires letting go. Uh, of all that vengeful feeling, which actually comes naturally. Uh, we are wired to do that. We're wired to determine uh, whether an interaction is fair or unfair. Uh, we respond to that neurologically. Uh, there, we have chemicals that run through our body that make us upset and angry. There are parts of our brain light up that make us vengeful uh, and want to lash back. Uh, but we can't do that forever. We can't let that cortisol, that hormone run through our body forever. It kills us. It will kill you eventually uh, if you're tense and stressed and angry all the time. So forgiving uh, lets go of a lot of that. Um, uh, asking for forgiveness is a very, very powerful tool. 
So moving from there, I, the part about asking for forgiveness, it's a good piece moving on is uh, when, when, when you apologize, be clear about what it is that you did um, that, that you're not going to do again. What was the offense? What was the thing that upset your fellow worker, your, your, the, the person at the cubicle next to you? If, if you're clear about that, you express that, uh, that you're not going to do that again, and, and then it really helps that other person uh, accept you as uh, recognizing the offense and, and uh, sincere about moving forward and working with them. Uh, so, and, and then from there, I think uh, maintaining a good working relationship uh, requires that you be constantly listening uh, to them for uh, and treating them as legitimate uh, individuals that, that are your partners uh, in the endeavor that you're engaged in. And that requires constant communication. It requires consulting them before you decide to do something or before you go around them or before you uh, act in such a way that may in some way affect or harm them. Uh, always try to understand their perceptions. Uh, never act when you're emotional. The count to 10 thing is extremely powerful. Uh, so always balance reason uh, with emotion. Never make a decision uh, when emotions are high uh, in the workplace. Um, and eventually, I think uh, through these behaviors, you will develop trust, but always, always work on well-founded trust. That is, be wholly trustworthy yourself, but not necessarily always trusting. Trust but verify, I guess, mm -hmm. might be yeah. um, uh, something that people have, have heard before. And, and going back to the triangle where you have that power approach, uh, try to use persuasion. Always try to use persuasion rather than coercion. Coercion is the last, last uh, uh, approach, uh, last tool you want to pull out of the toolbox. So focus on persuasion. Yeah, I love that. You gave so many rich things in there. And I, I was, again, jotting down some notes. And um, what struck me was, first, I think the starting place of this is the apology, which I think you emphasize really well. And you said you want to make sure that you not only acknowledge in the apology what you did, but what you're not going to do going forward or what you're going to do differently going forward. And I think that's an important reminder for all of us so we don't just say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not really an apology. That's more of a sympathetic comment <laughs> uh, versus really saying, I did this thing. I did not intend for it to hurt you, but it did. And this is what I'm going to do differently going forward. But I think people don't consider, I know I don't, to include the ask for forgiveness at the end. I hope you can forgive me and we can move forward in a productive way or some statement around that. That, that invitation, I think, is important at the end. And then I also think um, just a good apology. You make a good point, point around this saying that, you know, a good apology, it doesn't end there. It's not like, okay, now I can go back to doing what I was doing before. I apologized. It requires a concerted effort to change behavior, whether that's, you know, uh, trying to be respectful of the person, bringing them in. Uh, but it, it does require a concerted effort. And I think if people see that concerted effort, even if it's not perfect all the time, they're more likely to give someone grace and move, move down that path. Beautiful. Um, well, well, believe it or not, we're already at, at time. So as we're getting close here to close, I always ask all my guests this question. What's one life hack you have for us that could help us live a life more free from dysfunction, personally or professionally? Well, I think uh, it's kind of summing up some of those last few things I was talking about. I'd put it in, in and this is not original with me, but I put it in one phrase that uh, be unconditionally constructive. Uh, uh, always look at your relationships with other people as an opportunity to be constructive. Always be seen as that person that is unconditionally constructive. Always trying to uh, work the problem to a, a good solution for everyone. Uh, and that requires that balance of emotion with reason understanding what the other side's perception is, being able to listen, to communicate effectively, uh, to, uh, to be trustworthy 
uh, and to develop these good working relationships with other people and to use persuasion uh, rather than coercion in your life. Uh, so be unconditionally constructive. Unconditionally my... constructive. Mm. Beautiful. So if so, you've been great. If, if people want to learn more about you, what you're up to, uh, uh, buy a copy of a book, whatever happens to be, where, where can they go? Well, um, I'd say uh, go to uh, my website uh, on the Georgia State College of Law website. So just look for my faculty link there. Uh, people are welcome to uh, email me at dyarn at gsu.edu. Uh, I'm not a big social media buff, so I don't have a whole lot of uh, Twitter accounts and all that kind of stuff out there. Uh, but I'm more than happy to, uh, you know, uh, talk to people and to uh, give people references to uh, other uh, resources uh, and, and such as well. Doug, I, thank you. This was great. I have a whole page of notes. And in fact, I've got a particular client in mind that I was taking notes with them as my thought. And, and I think I think you've given me some tools to take back to them. So thank, <laughs> thank you for that gift. Uh, You're they, very welcome. They definitely <laughs> need it. Um, and thank you for listening and, and watching the show. Of course, watch a new show every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. as we drop a new show and you can catch it on iTunes or on Facebook Live. Uh, and if you have not seen the Workplace Therapist site recently, check it out. We've got all of our prior shows, blogs, resources, articles, all for you to make your life and working lives that much more productive and healthy. And if you've enjoyed the show, and we certainly hope you have, please rate, review, and subscribe. That's how more people learn about the good work we're doing and join the tribe. And until uh, next time we connect, have a great week and an awesome life. Awesome.